Right, okay. Well, I make it a minute past the hour and uh, we're at 80 participants. I will uh, kick it off here if that's all right so that we can keep to time. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody. A really, really warm welcome to you um, to this webinar being organized by the Company of Biologists and by HUBS, which is the Heads of University Biosciences, um, which is a special interest group of the Royal Society of Biology. Now, um, I know that we have people joining us from all over the world. So good morning, good evening, uh, warm welcome. As we go through uh, the conversation today, you're very welcome to put your questions in Q&A and we will pick that up. We want this to be as informative and as meaningful to you as, as is going to be possible, right? But what are we here for? Really, the webinar is titled Increasing um, Your Visibility. And, and, you know, that's what it's all about. What we want to bring to you through this conversation is about you getting your work out there, you getting it seen, getting it noticed. We're hoping that we can perhaps bridge the gap between uh, libraries and researchers a little bit. We're hoping that we can touch on open access and it's such a fast moving field at the moment, open access. So hopefully we can familiarize and orient you with probably the latest in what's going on on the open access score um, and talk to you uh, in a way that I hope will be really helpful and practical about promoting your work and even pre-printing your work, right? So through the conversation, we're hoping to bust some myths for you. For instance, perhaps your principal investigator doesn't know all the places that's a brilliant place to publish or your colleagues who you're working with in the lab don't actually have the full view of where would be a great place to publish or what would be a good way to put your work out there and maybe a conversation with your librarian is the thing that you really really need to have perhaps another myth would be around uh, open access publishing and the fact that open access is not synonymous with paying an article publishing charge. There are many ways to achieve open access, many routes to doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, so you don't always have to pay a charge. So hopefully we can bust some myths like that for you um, and, and help you navigate this space. You know, there's there's so much that as as scholars and researchers, you are having to juggle and think about, right, in terms of, of your research. And in the mix, there are your funder policies, there are your own career progression goals, um, uh, there might be some institutional requirements. So how do you navigate that space? Well, one of the things that brings us as a group of panelists together is really that we are advocates of an open and uh, solid publication culture, right? So open standards and good standards of quality publishing. Um, and the second thing that brings us all together is really service to the scholarly community. So we'll get right into it. And I will um, start off by introducing uh, Catherine Brown, who is going to talk to us first. Catherine is executive editor of the development journal that's published by uh, the Company of Biologists. She is in the weeds of the day-to-day -day exchange with the editors in charge of the journal and the day-to-day -day running of the journal. And she comes with a wealth of experience having previously worked also at EMBO. So Catherine, I will turn it over to you to start off with how to tell a story. Sorry, I did the classical Zoom thing of forgetting to unmute. No um, problem, you all, welcome. Can uh, hear yes. me and see my screen okay? Yes, great, thank you. Um, so thanks everyone uh, for joining us. So I'm gonna start out with some sort of real basics um, around sort of, uh, writing a paper, telling your story, and then thinking about um, journal selection and how you, how you choose the right journal for any particular story. Um, and so to start out with, you know, I think it can, for younger researchers, at least be a slightly daunting prospect of starting to write a paper, particularly your first paper, and, and where you actually start with that. And so I thought that it would be useful just to sort of take you through at least sort of some of my recommendations about, about where you should start and how you should go through that, that process, just very, very briefly. Um, and I and, and the others will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And I think the first thing that I would say is that you know, writing a paper starts way before you're writing a paper. It starts when you're doing your research and planning out your figures. And I say this because it really helps you to figure out where you are uh, in the journey of your of your research. 
um, by starting to actually put together your figures as you're going. It helps you to figure out that you've got all the right controls, the right quantitation, the right replicates and so on. And also it really helps make sure that you've got all the original data to hand. And one of the things we're not really going to talk about today, but is obviously an important thing, is ensuring that original data uh, is available, should there be any uh, queries about your data. And actually just thinking that process right from the very beginning, I think is a really important um, thing for you. Um, I'm going to talk more about journal selection in a minute, but again, as you start to write the paper, really thinking about who your audience is, 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 is really important because who's going to read your paper is going to influence how you actually write it. And paper writing is storytelling. We like uh, reading stories, we like listening to stories, and really a paper wants to take the reader through a journey. And so you don't need to present your results in chronological order. Uh, you need to remember that necessarily you know, the experiments that are the hardest to do aren't necessarily the ones that are the most informative. And so as you're starting to uh, take those figures that you put, you know, put together as you're going along and plan them out, really thinking about how you're going to lead the reader through your story that you want to tell. Um, don't skim over the details. I think this is critical. I think that um, it can be hard when some journals have uh, length limits on papers, but really making sure that you provide enough information for somebody to understand what you've done and ideally be able to replicate it uh, is absolutely essential. And there are, I would say, also venues in which you can provide more information on protocols in a separate publication uh, if that is an, a useful way of doing it. And then finally, I said, don't hide the uncertainties or the missing links. Make them part of the narrative. Don't necessarily, we all know that science is messy. And so don't necessarily try to pretend that you have a clean story if there are some uncertainties or missing links. We want to know what the next research is going to tell us, what the next paper is going to start looking into. Um, this is, I think, you know, a fairly obvious one, but make sure that you read and then cite the literature appropriately. Um, and ideally citing the primary literature rather than reviews wherever possible. Um, and Theo later is going to talk a lot more about preprint servers, but making sure that you check the preprint servers for the latest work and cited those as well uh, is becoming increasingly important. And then finally, seek critical feedback and seek critical feedback from somebody outside your lab and perhaps outside your immediate field uh, so that you can get the best view on whether your paper is appropriately written for the audience that you're looking, uh, looking, to pub looking at. So then once you've got your paper, or in fact, you know, before you've got your paper, you're going to be writing it with potentially with a journal in mind. And so what you want to be thinking about is, is you've thought about who you want to read it, but how, you, how is your journal going to help you reach that audience? Are you looking at a technical audience or are you looking at people with, from within your own field? Are you aiming to reach the specialists or do you think that this has general appeal? How the journal will help you to reach those audiences should be part of your decision on where you're going to publish. And so, you know, lots of journals now will, will really try and help you get your message out there be that through press releases, through social media, through interviews with the authors. These are just some examples taken from, from development in the Journal of Experimental Biology, where um, you know, we try really hard to help authors to reach their audience. So uh, in the case on the right, um, through press releases to reach the sort of general public, and down at the bottom, the Twitter feed by really featuring the authors and the story behind the paper um, through interviews as well. Another thing that's gonna be really important to you is sort of what's the editorial process? How likely is your paper going to be? How is it, how likely is it your paper will be accepted? Um, how long is it going to take? And sort of how how are you going to be uh, treated through that process? And I think you know increasingly journals um, are starting to make some of that um, data available. And here's just two examples: one taken from development and one taken from eLife, um, which actually just shows that, that journals are starting to be more open about how long it takes them to do things, uh, what the success rate is, and sort of how your paper is going to fare. And I think the other important thing to note here is that there's often, uh, not necessarily, but often a trade-off between speed, getting your paper published, and what we might describe as impact, although I think, you know, many of us on the panel probably really dislike that word, um, but sort of um, that you're going to, if you want to get your paper uh, published in some of the, what we would call the top journals, that's likely to take a very long time compared to if you aim for uh, perhaps a, a more community-specific journal. <coughs> Another thing that may be uh, important to you uh, are the open science practices of the journal. Now, I'm not going to talk about open access because Claire's going to talk about that uh, in a few minutes. But open science is about much more than just open access. It's about transparency. It's about accessibility. So it's around sort of data deposition, code availability, open or transparent peer review, uh, reproducibility and so on. And some of those things may may matter a lot to you and some of those may matter less but it's important that you know what your journal target journals policies are on those and again these are all things that we'd be happy to pick up again uh, in the discussion later 
And just finally, I think um, it's important to note, I'm sure that you've all seen, or many of you will have seen emails uh, like this. These are just a couple that landed in my inbox over the last uh, month or so of um, predatory journals reaching out, trying to encourage you to submit papers. And I think it's really important that you're able to recognize a predatory journal um, and that you can uh, avoid sending your work there. It's not gonna do uh, you or, or your colleagues any good by publishing in these kinds of venues. Um, they're really there to, uh, to take your money rather than to do anything good with your paper. And there are now some sort of uh, good ways of trying to identify um, predatory journals. So on the left here, there's just a table that lists some of the sort of characteristics that these kinds of journals have. And there is now a, um, a tool to help you try and identify predatory journals, which is called Think, Check, Submit. And I'd encourage you to go and take a look at that when you're thinking about um, perhaps journals that you're not so familiar with as possible venues uh, for your work. And then just finally, I think that we all now are in a position where we can make value choices about the journals that we choose to publish in. And this is potentially a complex decision, but the kind of questions around how will the journal handle your paper and what's the publisher going to do with your with your money um, if you are paying an APC or if you're um, otherwise sort of uh, funding that journal in some way. And so um, commercial society and not-for-profit journals all have potentially quite different ethoses. Um, some journals will operate with professional editors, others with academic editors. There are no right answers here, um, but I think that it's important that everybody really does think about um, the values of the journal that they're publishing in and make some decisions on where they're going to publish, not only based on um, sort of the outward face of the journal, but also sort of what's behind the scenes. And with that, I will um, close and pass on to, uh, I think it is Claire who's speaking next. Thank you. It is Claire, but before we do, if I may come in and do my intermediary bit, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. There's a couple of things I did want to uh, quickly say. One is when we opened, I entirely forgot to time and date stamp this conversation. So we're recognizing that uh, anybody can watch this back at any time. So things that you will hear today, especially citations or facts or figures, they are true as of the 23rd of February, 2023. Do please bear that in mind. Um, the other thing is just to uh, warmly welcome any questions in the Q&A section. What we will do is be looking at those questions, bank them and have some really interesting discussion once each of the panelists uh, have finished. But for instance, while Catherine was talking there, I had some questions developing around impact and what don't we like about impact and perhaps what are top tips around data availability. So, you know, maybe we'll come to some of that in the discussion. But first, I will hand over, uh, with many thanks to Catherine, I will hand over to Claire Moulton. Now, uh, Claire is publisher at the company of biologists, and um, she was a uh, uh, the company of biologists, I should note here, was the first publisher to be afforded transformative journal status by Plan S. Uh, they adopted a very, very quickly adopted a read and publish model. And Claire is going to tell us uh, a bit more about that. And hopefully, I think in this segment, also bust some myths around uh, access to open access and routes to open access publishing. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Malavika. Um, so yes, so I'm going to be talking about the efforts that many journals are making to move towards open access, um, and that op opens up more op options to authors and the benefits of open access publishing. I'm going to mainly use examples from the company of biologists, but I'm also going to touch on a few examples from the Society Publishers Coalition, which is a group of more than 100 like-minded um, publishers who've um, grouped together um, to share best practice. So when we talk about open access, there are quite a few different varieties, but the ones that you're most likely to hear us talk about are green, gold and diamond. So green is essentially a self archiving option that can be delayed by an embargo and it's often paired with a subscription model. So it doesn't really conform to the full um, benefits of open access. Gold open access is kind of the standard, um, which would be that an article is open access immediately upon publication. Um, articles are free to read by everyone but usually in this model, the author pays an open access fee or an APC to publish. And articles are published under a Creative Commons license, usually the CC BY license, which means that anyone can share and adapt the work, but they must attribute the original source. So this isn't someone trying to copy your work and pass it off as their own. Diamond is essentially the same as gold open access, but the difference here is the financial model. So the idea is that there is no author fee and no reader fee 
for the content. Um, so it's really about the finances. Um, so I'm going to now jump in with a headline, which is that there are benefits to publishing open access for authors. Um, so what we've done here, this, uh, these are the company biologists uh, metrics. We have taken open access articles and non-open access articles published in the same journal, and we have compared their metrics. And we can see that open access articles receive more usage at least threefold. We have a citation advantage, and there's also an alt metrics boost, which is the online attention received by your articles, including social media. The Microbiology Society has described this in words as open access publishing expands your reach, increases your impact, and of course publishing in a community journal um, helps to support your community. And then another example is from the Royal Society um, publishing journals um, showing the proportion of downloads and metric scores going to their open access and subscription articles. As Malavika said, we're trying to bust a few myths. So one of those uh, is that in the past, people used to say that open access journals are low quality and many of them are predatory. Now, Catherine's touched on um, how you might spot a predatory journal. But what we really want to emphasize is that there are a huge number of very high quality open access journals. And also there are a, a large number of quality journals that are trying their very best currently to move towards open access as quickly as possible. And that's really the focus of my talk, so that you can understand these arrangements that libraries and um, publishers are coming to, to help authors choose open access. So I'm going to mention here the Society of Publishers Coalition published a white paper that um, hopefully uh, someone will pop into uh, the link into the Q&A for you to see. Um, and this is about journals moving towards open access and also away from authors paying fees. So a model with no fees, no APCs. And there are four main types um, of approach. The first is transformative agreements. These have names like read and publish, publish and read. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those in a moment because the company of biologists has taken the read and publish approach. The second one is a transformative journal, and as Malavika mentioned, um, our journals were the first to be granted transformative journal status, and we've combined that with the read and publish agreements to help us move forward. Now, a transformative journal makes a public commitment to open access, um, to promote the benefits of open access publishing to authors. Um, it has particular open access growth targets each year, and also needs to be more transparent about its policies and its progress towards open access. The third um, route is to flip all or part of the content in a journal. For example, the research articles might be fully open access and the review type articles might be retained behind a subscription barrier. And then the fourth one is subscribe to open and other supporter type models. And I like to view this as um, it's being quite a, a, a charitable thing in some ways in that the richer organisations and institutes subscribe to a journal, help to support the publisher to make that journal open access, meaning that it's available for authors and readers as a fully open access journal globally. And it's interesting to note that some of the born OA um, publishers like PLOS are also um, using these sorts of models to move um, away from author fees. At the same time, these journals should be making open access options easy for authors. Um, for example, they might identify those authors eligible for fee-free open access publishing and, and make, make, it sh make sure that they know those options are available to them. And they might also help you with things like a deposition service, should your funder mandate um, deposition into PubMed Central, for example. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the read and publish arrangements. And first off, what that looks like from the library point of view. And librarians do see these arrangements as supporting their authors. So there are two parts of the arrangement, a read and a publish uh, part. Um, in the read portion, um, the library pays the same subscription as they did previously, but if perhaps they um, subscribe to only one or two of our journals, through this arrangement they will now get read access to all of our journals and all of our content, um, so that all of the readers in the institute can access our content. In the publish element, what we do is we ask for the average um, uh, revenue that we've received from APCs from their authors previously. But again, we've tried to keep that price the same, but often more. And so in this, we say that corresponding authors from the institution can now publish all of their articles with us uh, with gold open access without having to pay a fee. 
And we really feel strongly about this uncapped nature. So there is not a budget that will run out at some random point. Um, it's important to us that both the librarian and the author knows what to expect from the journal um, throughout the process. Looking at that read and publish arrangement then from the author side, um, is that it adds another option when you're uh, publishing with a journal. So the three options available to authors. The first option is that you don't choose open access. It's completely free to publish with us. Your content will be behind a subscription barrier for six months before it's free to read by everyone. The second option is that you can choose gold open access and pay an open access fee, an APC. Um, and this might really suit authors whose funders and institutions mandate open access and support the funding of that by paying the, um, the open access fee on behalf of the author. But now we add the third option, which is that if your institution has a read and publish agreement with us, then as a corresponding author, you can publish open access with us without having to publish, uh, without having to pay a fee on any of the articles that you publish with us. Um, and so obviously it's a very good arrangement. And this has obviously been very popular. So authors um, whose institutions have entered into agreements with us um, have been delighted to find that they can publish open access without paying a fee. And we've really found that this is what is driving the growth of open access in our journals. So we've only been offering read and publish agreements for the last three years. And you can see that it's very much um, that portion shown in green in these charts that is um, pushing the open access growth um, across our transformative journals. So very important. And to show it on a larger scale, this is from the Society Publishers, uh, Society Publisher Coalition's um, white paper. So this is 100 plus members showing that um, their journals are shifting towards open access. The different coloured bars are for different um, levels of open access publishing. And you can see that over time, more um, of those publishers and more of their journals are moving towards open access publishing. With the gold bar showing the proportion of all published articles that are open access, moving from less than 5% in 2012 to more than 20% in to uh, 2021. Um, so that's very important um, progress pushing towards open access. Now, how might you know um, what options are available from the journals that you want to publish in? Um, if you're lucky that um, your funder is a member of Coalition S, then Plan S have actually provided a journal checker tool for you. So here is an example where we've entered um, a journal the funder and an institution. And the tool in, uh, indicates this is for one of our journals, that there are three publishing options that would be compliant with the, with the open access policy. The preferred option is the transitional agreement. So this is the read and publish agreement. It's preferred by the funder and it's preferred by us as the publisher. Because we also have transformative journal status, we have a second um, option, which is an author paying an APC and still being compliant with the open access policy. And then there's a third option um, entitled self-archiving, which is often referred to as rights retention strategy. So we do allow this in our journals, but you can see that it is not the preferred route for the funder, and it's also not our preferred route. In many ways, we see it as being a necessary um, offering to authors, but that it can in many ways undermine our aims to move um, towards gold open access. Um, it, for institutions entering into read and publish agreements with us, um, you should also um, hope for communications from your librarian. So uh, when librarians enter into agreements with us, we actually provide materials to help them do this. And they will be um, letting you know about arrangements for fee-free publishing um, in the journals that, um, that you want to choose. The journal will also do direct um, promotion of these arrangements to you as an author. Um, for example, on the journal website, there's a list of institutions participating in read and publish agreements so that you can check to see whether you're eligible for fee free publishing. But we also email eligible authors when that institution signs an agreement with us. Um, and we display banners like the one shown at the bottom of my slide. Um, in, we only do this in countries with a really good uptake of read and publish agreements um, so that you know, almost everybody seeing this advert will be eligible um, for a, a fee free publishing. For example, the UK has very widespread read and publish coverage. Um, but I'd also like to point out that we have um, a special arrangement with IFL, which means that we offer um, read and publish uh, for free through, through um, 30 developing and transition economy countries, um, which is important to us for equity. And then finally, as I've said, 
think through the journal workflow, those journals should be making it easy for you as authors to know what open access options are available to you. And so that you can really consider which uh, options you want to choose. Remembering um, those comparative metrics I showed at the start, that choosing open access does give a benefit in terms of usage citation and out metrics. So I'm gonna finish by just showing a slide um, that indicates that publishers like us um, are working really very hard to move towards open access. It's a big change. We're working with many, many um, parties and sharing best practice. Um, but in particular for authors, we're trying to share the benefits of open access by showing our comparative metrics. On our websites, we have how-to guides and FAQs about how to publish using the read and publish route. And we've also done an interview series um, so that authors can see uh, people who've used it previously. Uh, and in fact, their enthusiasm um, for being able to publish open access without paying a fee. So I'm going to finish there. And I look forward to seeing some of your questions um, later on in the session. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, um, Claire. Now, uh, hopefully you have successfully uh, received in in chat facing all of the participants the links just in case that hasn't worked because as panelists we have uh, a, an exclusive chat and so we can't see what you're seeing unfortunately um, but in case that hasn't worked then just to reassure registrants that we will be able to follow up with some links to these uh, the references that have been uh, made over the course of uh, these presentations so we will follow up by email we've also already had uh, some use of the Q&A function and some panelists dipping in to answer. So do, do express your questions in there, because if we can get to them while others are speaking, we will do that. But we will also definitely have a conversation. Now, coming back to uh, some of the things Claire was saying, for instance, I'd be very tempted uh, once we get to the discussion section to find out, Claire, what does the future hold then? If you're, if you, if you are going fee free, and I think you call it free free, Fee free open access. I like to think of it almost as automatic open access for those authors who are affiliated with, dare I say it, the right institutions, right? So it, a deal has to be in place with the with the library, right? And this is where the library perspective is going to become really important. Um, so that's automatic OA. What next and how do we kind of make it even more inclusive uh, than that? So we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But for now, we will move on to have a talk from Theo, because one of the things, like I said at the start, is maybe you don't want a journal at all. Maybe what you want is a preprint. And so I'm really, really happy uh, to be able to welcome Theo. Uh, Theo Bloom is executive editor of the BMJ um, and she is also the person that sort of coordinates a lot of open access and open research uh, initiatives at the BMJ. She is also co-founder of MedArchive and she will tell you a lot more about that very shortly but previously uh, Theo has been at Nature, she's been at Elsevier, she's been at the Public Library of Science um, and she has a PhD in developmental cell biology so if you are not wowed enough by by all of that, be wild as she takes us through the preprint perspective. Thanks very much, Malavika. Um, I'm just going to share my slides, I hope, um, and uh, put them in presentation mode so that uh, you all can see the same thing I am. Um, sorry, it's taking a moment. Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to talk primarily about preprints and how they can help improve the visibility and impact of research. And um, uh, as Malavika told you, my, my day job is that um, I'm executive editor of the BMJ, which is a journal that has open access for its research, but does receive other sorts of funding, including subscriptions and advertising revenues. But probably most relevant for this talk is that I helped found the Med Archive clinical preprint server. Um, and so just so we're, check we're all on the same page. Uh, when I say preprint, what I mean is uh, an article that is posted without having been certified by any journal uh, as having been peer reviewed. And a preprint server being a, a specialized platform that exists to distribute preprints. Um, sorry, my slides are not progressing. There we go. Oh. Uh, and you will know that preprint servers are proliferating. There are a lot of them. 
many organized by subject specialty, some organized by um, uh, geography, for example, African research archive or a Japanese one, sometimes in, in not in English. And um, to Catherine's point earlier, many are non-profit, some are operated by for-profit publishers, uh, for example, SSRN, owned by Elsevier and linked uh, most tightly with their journals. And so the case for preprints is pretty easy to make. They speed up the dissemination of research. If you share your results as soon as you've written up that paper, uh, it will usually be between four and 12 months faster uh, than if you wait to share it when a journal has completed its detailed peer review. Um, you can get feedback and amend your article before its final published form. Uh, and you're getting many more eyeballs on it than those two or three peer reviewers a journal selects. You've put a date stamp out of when you finished that work and wrote it up. And most preprints are freely available, although they don't always meet the full criteria of open access. But the risk that everyone sees, and particularly when we talk about medical preprints, is what if you put something out there that's wrong and that that ends up harming people, which obviously is not any part of what any of us are in this business to do. So we got involved in founding Med Archive, which was a joint venture between Cold Spring Harbor Lab, which owns and operates BioArchive in the biological sciences, uh, BMJ, which publishes medical journals and has a lot of experience of screening and assessing medical uh, articles, and uh, some colleagues, clinical colleagues at Yale University who are great advocates of preprints and wanted to help make sure that, that clinical preprints could be done safely. Um, and so it's um, this is a not-for-profit service. Although BMJ is involved in running it, it's publisher neutral. All publishers can uh, receive articles that have been in MedArchive. Many journals link back and forth uh, with MedArchive. Um, it launched in the last part of 2019, just nicely poised for what hit medical publishing in 2020, and is now supported by the nonprofit Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. The uh, foundation started by Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan uh, to help. Their, their aim is to cure all disease in 100 years. So they want everything, maybe less than 100, I can't remember, but they want you know, science to move very much faster than it does right now. Um, so you know, why, why are people posting so many more preprints now than they did previously? I think partly there's that recognition that preprinting prevents scooping rather than promoting it. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. That funders are welcoming what they call interim research outputs, things that aren't yet published papers being put out. And in the case of the pandemic, many funders actively encouraged preprinting. Um, funders allow them to be cited in grant applications. Um, and there's just a general view that they're part of the open research movement. And maybe it's also generational change away from uh, people who grew up in a print world to those who expect to share things openly on the web. Um, but I want to give an example of why I think preprints are really important. And depressing though it is, I want to take you back to June 2020, where in the UK, we had been in lockdown for a number of weeks. People were dying at the rate of thousands a day of COVID. There were no vaccines and no treatments. And uh, Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, issued a press release and a letter to the entire NHS saying, effectively, I'm glad to tell you that the recovery trial has found that a cheap and readily available drug, dexamethasone, uh, can be used for patients uh, who are on ventilators and may reduce uh, mortality by maybe 15% and, and reduce uh, the uh, for patients who are this, the, the most ill, possibly as much as 35%. And really, this was an edict that says start prescribing dexamethasone. That's on the basis of no, no data, no paper, nothing. Uh, one week later, um, there was a preprint. 
uh, that was a fully written up paper with all the data, with all the supplementary information uh, available for people to use. And I would argue that is a much better approach than just a press release from the chief medical officer. And in this case, it took only a month for the New England Journal of Medicine um, to uh, peer review and publish the article. But again, I would argue that month is not one that any of us wanted to say, see any more people die than had to uh, during the COVID pandemic. But it, it's not just about uh, COVID. So um, uh, that's the, the final article, which of course, you know, is certified, fully peer reviewed uh, and ava permanently available as is the preprint. Um, another example of a paper that had been a preprint and was subsequently published, um, was by my Medoc colleague, Harlan Frumholtz, who's a cardiologist. And he and his team had modeled, they had heard that the uh, American uh, Heart Association and College of Cardiology were likely to change the threshold at which they recommended prescribing uh, antihypertensive drugs for blood pressure medication. Um, and they did some modeling the, to work out how many more people would be medicated as a result of the recommendations. And they were able, if on the same day that the uh, new recommendations came out, to post a preprint that modeled how many more people would be uh, taking the medication. That paper, as it happens, was submitted to the BMJ. It was published around uh, eight months later with some significant uh, modifications after full peer review, but with major messages unchanged. And of interest, I think, to this audience would be the fact that both times this research was press released, covered widely in the literature. And what's more, because it was one of the relatively early examples of preprinting in medicine, the authors wrote a blog post for BMJ about how it was to preprint and why they did it. And it was picked up by New England Journal of Medicine, who at the time did not uh, endorse the use of preprints, but now do, uh, as an opportunity to say, what is, what is this preprinting and how might it change how we think about journals in one of their uh, blogs and podcasts. So that, that uh, work certainly got multiple levels of, of attention following preprinting. Um, I know people worry about whether journals will take um, papers off, they've been pre-printed. This is a medically focused slide, but it, it tells you that really most major publishers now are perfectly happy that work is pre-printed on a recognized preprint server before it appears in the journal. One exception in the medical community is the Journal of the American Medical Association, but others have come along. But the Sherpa Romeo uh, database, which Claire already uh, referred to about open access uh, policies, uh, and so on, will tell you what a journal says about whether you can post a preprint, archive your own copy, and so on. Um, so wh why are people doing this? Here's, here's one example of someone who says, I posted a preprint and pretty immediately journal editors started asking for my paper. And even while it was under review at one journal, another journal was saying, well, if that doesn't work, come to us. So instead of having the traditional model that says the author has to shop around to find the right journal, the journals are coming to the author. Um, and this is from an organization, Asset Bio, which works to promote uh, speed, as you would expect in preprinting in biology. Um, and you can see other examples of such stories. There's one more to come from me as well. When you survey authors who have posted preprints, why are you doing it? Um, this is a paper from another colleague, uh, Richard Sever, at Cold Spring Harbor and focused more on bioarchive. But the top reason that people will post a preprint is to increase awareness of their research. But, you know, right up there is staking their priority domain and, and getting feedback. So those really are the main reasons people are doing it. Um, and it does demonstrably accelerate the pace of science. This is an example that was posted on Twitter of uh, someone seeing a preprint, getting into conversation about the paper with the author, starting a collaboration. That collaboration was all, already at the point of doing work by the time the paper was published. And if it had to wait until the paper was published, that would have been 
several months of delay. And Steve Quake uh, calculated, you know, if you remove that lag time of, of a year on average for publications, in 10 years, you'd have a five-fold acceleration of the rate of discovery. And that's the interest in many of the funders and so on in uh, it, it promoting preprints is to increase that pace. Just a couple of more examples. Nikolai Slabov, an associate professor, um, posted his first preprint on Bioarchive um, 2015. He, um, it was subsequently published, um, but you know, a number of, more, more than a year later in this instance, which I think is not entirely atypical. But it, in the meantime, um, he had comments from two of the leaders in his field directly on his preprint that were sufficiently engaged and uh, led to enough interaction that in the final article, there are acknowledgements to those people for uh, helping with the development of the final article. And as he said, he doesn't worry about being scooped when he knows that major leaders in the field are interacting with his work at preprint stage. Uh, finally, this, you know, very stark statement, a preprint got me a faculty job because when uh, early career researchers are applying for their first tenured position, they're often, they have work in preparation or in manuscript form, but it's not yet published. But if they post it as a preprint, the hiring committee can read the whole thing and uh, form their view and can see what else people are saying publicly about the work. So I think I'll stop there. And like others, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Theo. Now, the, the Q&A is alive and kicking. And thank you for all your questions. If we are not getting to them immediately and not typing answers, please rest assured we will talk about this. And, some really interesting questions coming up, some uh, questions about uh, publishing costs and how to achieve open access when costs are a barrier. There's some questions about versions of articles and which to cite. And maybe Theo, uh, you know, you can talk to it. You know, there's the preprint, there's the repository version, there's a final version. Uh, but between you, I'm sure Stephen and Theo, you'll have some, some thoughts on that. So great stuff. Uh, thank you so much for all your questions. Please do keep them coming. We're working hard to make sure we're logging all the questions and answering them when we can. Uh, we will talk about these things as well. But now it's my great pleasure to turn to the institutional perspective um, and we were we were really determined that we could not leave this angle out right the 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 library does a huge job uh, in helping getting research out there and I'm a little bit fearful that perhaps researchers don't speak to their librarians as much as um, they probably should or could there's certainly masses to be gained from talking to your librarian now Stephen Vidovich he is head of open research and publication practice at the University of Southampton in the UK um, he has a PhD in earth and environmental sciences he spent some time as a lecturer he then went off and worked for a commercial publisher and and managed a, a commercial portfolio of journals which gave him a lot of insights into the scholarly communications world from that that angle and then in 2018 he returned to the the university uh, sector and as I said he's at the University of Southampton um, and I will turn it over to Stephen he is really enthusiastic about knowledge exchange Stephen tell us your perspectives thank you very much Malavika um you've done quite a bit for me there which is very <laughs> handy uh because part of uh, my talk is about making you all aware uh, of of what the uh, our situation is at Southampton, so that you under and, and and who I am, so that you understand where we're coming from, because we've all got different perspectives. We're all uh, privileged in different ways, and I think that that's important because I'm here to represent the institutional view, but I don't necessarily uh, look like every institution. I don't necessarily. Uh, look like the librarian at your institution, the support structures around me might not be exactly the same, but I hope that uh, some of the information that I share is uh, similar and if not necessarily in the actual practices, certainly in, in the principles that, that feed into those practices. Uh, 
So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, nurturing your research and growing an open research environment. So just for that context, the University of Southampton is a is a, an institution, a research intensive institution, um, part of the Russell Group. It's located on the south coast of England in the UK. Um, and I'm very aware of that and and uh, the fact that that gives me a very specific uh, view of things. Um, in terms of uh, people, we have quite a diverse uh, community of researchers. We have uh, a very balanced uh, portfolio from arts and humanities to social sciences, uh, to, to uh, the, the physical sciences and engineering, uh, and also the environmental and life sciences. Um, and indeed, with my background in earth and environmental sciences, I, I'm, I'm a systematist, so um, I have uh, quite quite a lot of uh, affinities uh, uh, to those people that I'm talking to today, I suppose. Um, and the uh, we also have partnerships. So we have the University Hospital Southampton uh, and we also have uh, the, the National Oceanographic Centre at Southampton. Uh, so we have different campuses, uh, sometimes that are part of other research organisations, but they are partnered to us. So in terms of what we're trying to achieve in the institutional context is uh, actually opening up our content as quickly as possible and uh, the most robust and up to date version of that research to be shared as, as widely as possible. So I guess if we were putting it in an order of priority, not necessarily that anything is better, but we'd like the version of record uh, of an article to be opened up. Um, and that would be through publisher enabled open access. So through the gold route or the uh, diamond route, um, which was discussed uh, earlier, um, we would, but we, we recognize that that's not necessarily always possible, uh, especially where a fee needs to be paid and that there needs to be a sustainable transition uh, to open access. And it's worth noting that part of that institutional concept uh, context of the University of Southampton. We're also where the ePrints repository software was developed. And so the University of Southampton in the early part of the 21st century was uh, instrumental in the development of what is known as green open access. And we see that as part of the sustainable transition towards full and immediate open access, as well as transformative agreements, which I'm using in a really, really broad term here. So I'm actually also thinking of um, uh, agreements with publishers that enable um, no additional cost publishing for the authors. Um, so that might actually uh, also include uh, born gold open access journals, such as the PLOS agreement that we have, which enables our researchers to publish with them for no additional fees. Um, and also um, the, uh, the, the transformative agreements in, in the sense of um, subscribe to open uh, which was mentioned earlier, uh, which is a way of uh, us uh, working in a sort of more philanthropic way to open up content. Uh, but I would say that ultimately all of our um, our agreements that we make with publishers are, are kind of um, born in that sense anyway. They're very similar to subscribe to open. For example, uh, the repository enabled open access uh, can only be possible if the content is published in the first place. So in order for us to open up an accepted manuscript in an institutional repository, there has to be an accepted article that has gone through to be published in a um, subscription journal. So therefore, as those subscription journals need to be sustainable and continue to exist. Um, so it'd be very foolish indeed if we just, uh, based on the fact that uh, green open access is available to us, just cut subscriptions. Um, so we do try to ensure that uh, platforms that support our communities are sustainable. And so ultimately, we're looking for a sustainable mix of models suited to the community needs in order to deliver full and immediate open access. Um, and then sometimes, uh, that means that, or many times, in fact, that means that we can have progressive um, and um, even disruptive um, relationships with publishers 
in order to achieve what we're trying to. Uh, and sometimes it means we need to get on our soap boxes and, and shout for what we want as well, uh, which is also part of my job. So um, why are we actually trying to do this? So as I say, the University of Southampton has an invested interest in the sense that we uh, developed um, ePrints repository software. But I suppose, why did we, why did our researchers even do that in the first place? What was the driver? Um, it, and so from an, I've, I sort of spent five minutes thinking this through and from an institutional context, we're looking to democratize our research. We're trying to enhance our impact. We're trying to foster future collaborations and build, have our research built upon uh, and, and develop those opportunities both for enterprise and also for example our, our institutes and our research organizations getting recognition uh for for the work that we do and the money that is invested in that work um it's about profile raising um and also to a certain extent constraining costs so not entirely eliminating them um but indeed <coughs> excuse me uh trying to constrain those costs so that they don't spiral out of control and the transition is sustainable and it doesn't have an unintended impact on other areas of our work. And then from the point of view of the researcher, the author, it may be that you can raise your profile, enhance the impact of your, your work, which in turn will raise your profile, um, foster future collaborations and build upon your research so you can actually uh, go out there and, and make new opportunities for yourself. Um, there is, to a certain extent, in engaging with um, open research more generally, IP protect protection. Uh, so Theo was talking about getting a timestamp on your preprint, and the effect of doing that is you're getting priority uh, for your idea being out there in the public domain. Uh, so it's a way of protecting your IP. Um, there, are, it, you can you can develop future opportunities um, with machine readable uh, research. So, the more interoperable and interlinked our data is, the more machine readable our research papers and research data are. Uh, the the better we can make use of big data and syntheses uh, in order to benefit the public and the research community. Uh, and so, therefore, there are reciprocal benefits to everyone involved. There are challenges, um, don't get me wrong. So these, those are all uh, very grand ideas. Um, part of the challenge is growing awareness, actually having community engagement, which is why we engage in knowledge exchange uh, activities such as these, which is why we also uh, run all sorts of engagement activities across the university and, and with other uh, third party stakeholders. Um, there are challenges to actually being open throughout the research life cycle. So actually trying to get people to engage with this, uh, not just at publication. Often uh, there's a focus on uh, the publication of the version of record and this green and gold open access um, debate because it's uh, one of the biggest problems that presents itself to us. But actually uh, there are different stages of the research life cycle that are important as well. Uh, such as um, engaging with preprints and also post-publication, uh, having proper preservation in place for your research data so that, uh, that you don't end up having to cause other researchers to replicate your findings uh, and uh, the, the costs that are involved in that. Um, reward and recognition is both a good thing and a problem. Um, the REF in the UK, for example, has been a brilliant driver uh, for making or not making, but getting people to engage with uh, open access publications. Uh, but equally, uh, reward and recognition wherever it exists uh, can also engage uh, less desirable behaviours and even misconduct. Um, and, and it's true that that does still exist around the idea of uh, publishing articles, paying to publish. Um, and, and of course, you know, trying to grow your publication record uh, very quickly, falling foul of predatory publishers, etc., uh, or salami slicing research. Uh, 
we have a responsibility to the funders agenda so uh we're actually one of the challenges is actually uh working within the permissive areas of the of the policies that exist but also uh trying to drive the chain that change that we're seeking uh robust metadata is a problem or, or lack thereof of robust metadata so that it uh, goes into what i was talking about before uh, with uh, growing our ability to benefit from the research uh, by making it more visible and also having it machine readable. Um, cost effective uh, transformational agreements are, are challenging. Um, and, and I think we can talk about that maybe in the panel session and uh, also actually having the capacity to build and support an open infrastructure is a difficult thing to achieve. So what we're doing at the University of Southampton in order to um, deliver on these ambitions and to overcome those barriers uh, is we're working with governance, uh, making de strategic decisions. Uh, we're educating our community. We're signposting people to resources that we're creating. Uh, we're delivering services to assist with the different routes to open access. We're detecting non-compliance with funder policies and we're intervening where it's necessary and we're also contributing to knowledge exchange. So in terms of actually how that uh, is embedded, it's kind of a clustered uh, set of uh, pieces of work. Um, so we're at, at an environmental level uh, in which all of the other things sit. Uh, we have local policy processes and resources. Uh, working with other stakeholders um, and exchanging knowledge um, and, and uh, working with activities in order to uh, inform sector-wide change. In terms of open research, uh, we need to maintain expert themes within the library. Uh, so these are operational working themes uh, in order for us to uh, seek opportunities to promote open research throughout its life cycle, deliver training, uh, provide facilities and uh, quality assurance for the repository, uh, engage with innovation and in enterprise. And uh, we work at the university within a triple helix strategy of research, education, enterprise. So actually uh, seeing through that triple helix strategy through uh, open research. More specifically, open access is in the open access of uh, published content. Um, we we have we need to maintain the repository uh we need to work with publishers uh to have agreements in place or uh, pay uh, article processing charges and uh, we need to maintain information systems to support our community and then post publication again maintaining expertise reporting uh we have a bibliometric service uh which ensures that we're using uh metrics on publications appropriately and not in a way that they uh, negatively affect our uh, community or individuals. Uh, we work in partnership with marketing and uh, our RIS department in order to ensure that there's um, a good approach to this across the entire university. And we also work on advocacy uh, to uh, get people to engage with that kind of activity. In terms of the education signposting, uh, we have um, these guides that we've got a picture of on the right hand side, uh, which um, we signpost people to. We run research symposia, um, which are really well attended, and we've had a great list of speakers in the past. Um, we uh, conduct knowledge exchange or knowledge transfer sessions so that we can make uh, groups and research departments aware of uh, latest developments in um, publishing or, or funding uh, sectors. Uh, we run town halls, um, we run other events uh, such as OA Week and Love Data. Uh, we keep our website up to date uh, with all the information that our community needs. And uh, we also contribute to newsletters and communications to, to try and get the message out there. In terms of the governance, um, we, have quite a complicated governance structure as I think most institutions do. Uh, but basically the library is feeding into and out of an open research group uh, and works with 
our uh, executive groups um, and uh, Senate, which is uh, from by the academics for the academics, uh, ultimately makes decisions that feed into our policy, which informs the way that the library supports uh, the, the community. Uh, we have many different library resources. I'm just uh, giving you an overview of those now. I'm just going to move on to show you one of those. We were one, among the first institutions in the UK to sign up to Sci Free. We this is a you said we heard kind of situation. Our community were saying to us, uh, "There are all these restrictions and policies and requirements coming in. Can you just give us a list of where we can publish?" Uh, but we couldn't do that because it's too difficult to keep up to date. Uh, these agreements are changing all the time. Uh, but then we found this uh, solution, which is Sci-Free, which is a searchable index of the agreements that we sign up to, which also allows us to give the local context. So it's slightly different to the journal checker tool in the sense that it allows us to consider our local position. Uh, similarly, we report uh, to Sorry, executive Stephen, boards. just to jump in very sure. quickly to say, hopefully you can wrap up soon yes, so we preserve I, some I, time for discussion. Thank yes, you. Yeah. So we report to executive boards on the reporting and intervention that we do. Uh, and we do this uh, using uh, dashboards and panels. Um, and likewise, we, uh, we innovate in order to capture those um, outputs that are uh, affected by rights retention um, or, or anything else. So we're, we're quite a diverse team uh, who are delivering um, on numerous different um, aspects that are pulling on our, our, uh, on, on our time in order to uh, deliver sort of systems, processes, technological approaches, expert um, content delivery in order to support our community uh, to ensure that they are well served and uh, able to um, actually achieve what they're hoping to with their research. So that's me then. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. And sorry, sorry to uh, rush you. I thought you were coming to the end, but I wasn't ex entirely yeah, that's sure. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, we, we've had a, a brilliant set of presentations uh, from from this lovely panel and uh, panelists. I if you wouldn't mind turning on your uh, uh, videos now because we're getting into this um, sort of discussion section, but I'm going to pull quite heavily from the raft of excellent questions that we are already uh, uh, getting in from the audience because um, they, they do overlap quite a lot with some of the things I thought would be quite interesting to play out as well. And if I may um, start with I guess what in my head is the biggie, right, which is about access to open access. So we've had more than one question really about the fact that open access publishing where it is attached to an APC, that's a barrier, that's a problem, especially for early career scientists, but, but personally, I think potentially for any science, uh, any scholar, right? Um, so can the panel give me uh, some, some of your views on this and at the same time I know Kim I've shared with you a, a, a link to an OASPA blog about this if you want to share that with people around uh, equity then that would be good but but uh, Claire if I turn it over to you in the in the first instance because this also links in perhaps with the separate question around if not read if not read and publish and not APC driven how else do we achieve OA and I think that's kind of the same question in other words yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think, you know, this is the direction that we're all wanting to move in. But we, you know, being really honest, I don't know exactly where we're going to end up in the future. So, you know, at the moment, we are trying to really um, promote, read and publish agreements, increase the numbers, which means that then any researcher in the institution, whether they're early career or, or later career, will have access to fee free publishing. Um, Obviously, we've taken the step through our rifle agreement to support um, fee-free publishing in you know, developing and transition economy countries, but that's not all of the countries that, you know, that might need that sort of support. Um, and I think that, you know, looking to the future, this is what we're trying to do. I believe that Plan S have just announced an initiative to bring people together to develop models for equity in terms of open access publishing. So I think that that 
I, I expect that that will actually be very useful um, in, mm. in bringing people together and helping us come to, you know, some consensus of ways forward. Um, and then in terms of the future of the agreements, clearly it has to have a new name because they will be called transitional agreements. And once you get to somewhere, it's no longer transitional. Um, I don't really mind what it's called. I think what I'm hoping is that our library partners will continue to support us, um, you know, we, so that you know we have a financially you know steady sustainable i think this is the word that stephen used a sustainable model that means we can continue doing quality publishing not cheap publishing necessarily but quality publishing um while not um having to um get authors paying fees so i kind of feel it's where we all want to head um but i'm not pretending it'll be easy to get over that final um hurdle um but you know the OSTP recommendation in the States will help this um, as more and more people are moving in the same direction. I think it just helps to build momentum. Absolutely. Thanks, Claire. And, and, and I think, you know, this is something that OASPA, which is uh, uh, where I'm affiliated, is also working towards. And I think you've got a, a, a link there in chat is bringing publishers and librarians together to puzzle out, OK, how do we uh, 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 work out new agreements and arrangements so that we can keep on sustaining open access publishing, which is open ac accessible to everyone, right? Because right now we're still kind of con constrained by the fact that you need to have a certain affiliation or you need to have uh, 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 to be from a certain country to avail of an APC waiver, for instance, and, and things like that. So certainly uh, uh, room to go to make open access better and more inclusive um, from that perspective. Uh, I don't know if any other panelists wants to uh, jump in on this point. If Stephen, did you want yeah, to come in? I, I can. I mean, I don't necessarily have the solutions, but I, I've seen the problems. Um, mm. I would, I'm, I'm part of a Research Libraries UK group, um, an open access publishing processes group. And uh, from the very first uh, transformative agreement that was uh, that was actually agreed, um, which which I think would have been the Wiley agreement, uh, because we were starting to make that um, agreement ahead of time. Um, I, I was immediately concerned about identifying people based on that who the corresponding author was, because yeah. I could see that it would potentially cause EDNI issues uh, because of the um, the fact that it might rob early career researchers or people at smaller institutions or people at uh, other uh, in institutions in other countries that weren't part of these agreements Yields. of that opportunity to get the reward and recognition for being the person who had uh, actually you know run the research and and been the person with with the greatest oversight of the project um yeah. it's a it's a problem that we've been working on for the last four years um and we, we've brought out guidance and we've we've uh tried to work with the publishers there are some i, I think wiley has actually now implemented the responsible corresponding author option for example uh, which allows someone to nominate themselves as the person who is facilitating the payment as opposed to the person who is the actual corresponding author in academic terms. Um, so th there's a way to go, um, but we've we've been working on it. And it, it's true to say, as soon as you start to solve one problem, you just create a whole raft Another. of other problems. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think that we just need to be really careful as we feel our way forwards to ensure that we don't do that in such a way that it disadvantages individuals who are potentially more vulnerable. So, for example, early career researchers, emeritus professors, uh, or, or even those people who are independent researchers or parts of very important smaller organizations, research yeah. organizations. Yeah. Uh, because or they clinicians. Have I've seen clinicians, they, clinicians come up as well. Clinicians yeah. does come up, and this yeah. is because they're quite often uh uh nhs um trust employees and so uh for example that they're, they're visitors at the university of southampton yeah. in our case and so they're not actually staff and students Under so they're the not theme. necessarily authorized users of the agreements we make yeah. Yeah. uh but also 
from a sustainability point of view, again, if we were to just open up the doors and say anyone affiliated to us can make use of these agreements and our publishing portfolio officially grows by 10%, what's well, to stop the publishers the next time we go to make an agreement quite reasonably saying, well, you better give us 10% more money. More money. Yeah. But where's that money coming from? Because we don't have funds to support people who are not our employees. It's a very challenging issue that we're trying to work with. So as I say, the, I'm highlighting the problems, but yeah. I don't have yeah. the solutions right now. No, indeed. And I think some some innovations are there because you speak, Stephen, exactly to the point that what we need is new models right new models and and you do have front runners of these new models so claire in her talk did mention subscribe to open and that's a you know taking completely different take on it and it means if there is a journal on the subscribe to open model anybody from anywhere regardless of their affiliation their paper will be open access in that journal, right? So we do have the, the likes of annual reviews and uh, International Water Association publishing. Um, and you do have some experimenters in this space doing uh, the S2O model. You do also have the diamond model, which is where you have a grant or a fund that sustains the journal. And then everything published in that journal is by default open access and there are no fees to the reader and no fees to the publisher and uh, in chat hopefully you have a link to the directory of open access journals the doaj um it's just doaj.org that's the link and that's a, a whole host of journals that are fully open access but there's a large number of them uh within that index of journals that that don't charge article publishing charges as well. But that brings me on to a next question, um, which is around uh, how does a researcher distinguish between uh, what looks like a very legitimate email coming and saying, oh, please write this article for our journal. And it's, it's formatted and, and has all the bells and whistles that you would expect from a very established publisher, but they're actually a predatory publisher. Um, and I know, Catherine, you talked about Think, Check, Submit um, and things like that. But I wondered, are there any tips beyond that to be able to notice and no, no, have researchers know what are the high quality OA journals I can trust versus the venues I can't trust? Oh, and I have Theo who's uh, put your hand up. So Catherine, Theo, whichever one, whoever one of you wants to go first. Uh, I was just going to say, because I put this in an answer to a question, but then they sort of disappear. Uh, I, uh, it's a particular problem because I think some of the bad faith actors do indeed deliberately try to use journal names and look and feel of websites that look very like uh, bona fide ones. But one, one fail safe that I've always used is to look for the contact details. And, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a Spring and Nature journal, you'll see Spring and Nature headquarters in London or, or Munich or whatever uh, as the address. And if it isn't, you'll see a PO box in uh, some other country uh, and no, you know, no phone number and no way to contact them. So they're, they're sort of the basics, a bit like when you worry about whether an email is really from who it says it is, and you look at the sender details and is it from the domain of the university they claim to be from, or is it some random Gmail account? It, it's the, the street address is one more kind of clue to, to genuine publishers. Thanks. Thanks, Theo. And uh, Catherine, did you did you want to um, add to that in any way? And I and I hope Kim has managed to put in chat as well a link to COPE guidelines, because I was thinking of whether the journalist signed up to COPE guidelines as an indicator. But over to you, Catherine. Yeah, so I think that um, also whether they are, um, you know, listed in things like DOAJ and some of those repositories that are sort of checking journals is a good place to to look for these, you know, these Predatory journals are often they're charging APCs. They may not actually be open access, but um, but that you know that's certainly one place to look. Uh, in my my talk, and I'll um, ask him to put it into the chat. There's also a um, a sort of table of a whole list of characteristics of of a predatory journal. I sort of skipped over it quite fast, but there are a whole load of things in there. I think for me, one of the things is you know the emails that start with a you know a greetings and have um, I think looking for typos things like that in their emails or on their websites are often giveaways. But as, as you know, Theo says, I think that the predatory journals are getting better um, at doing this. And I also think that, you know, it is very difficult when often they have names that sound 
very much like uh, you know a, a reputable journal name um, it can be very very difficult um, but I think there's sort of a, a host of things you can try and hope that between those you'll you'll pick them out. Great thank you Catherine and Stephen. I, I would say uh, go to your library uh, because they can go through the think check submit process with you we would also check if the journal was affiliated to cope we might even see also if it's preserved uh, in portico or clocks or something like that um the so that that's one aspect the other aspect is um following proper publication processes anyway um it's very it can be very tempting especially with the reward and recognition that i was talking about you know the the, the impending promotion process or something to, to uh, write an article that you've been invited to write because it, it may get an easier ride. But I, I would always just encourage researchers to uh, write something because it's a piece of research that they've been working on anyway. And, and if you've been doing that, then you should already have an idea of what you're looking to write, the structure of the article, and you should probably already have an idea of what your target journals are. The only exception to that would be if there was a uh, very specific special issue um, that is uh, important to your area of research, it's a good place for you to showcase what you've been working on recently, that kind of thing, in which case you would expect to recognise who the editors are. Uh, they should be quite prevalent in your field. Uh, so if it's some somebody quite random, um, then um, you should probably think of going through that think check submit um, workflow. Uh, but having said that, it's not uncommon for predatory journals to also go and grab people's names and just put them on their editorship lists anyway, um, without their knowledge. So uh, do look out for that. Great. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Any other comments on weighing up predatory versus proper? journals from the panel if not um my my next question was going to be uh, around now Theo you may have picked this up in chat but I thought that this was a a, a really good one perhaps for you and Stephen to speak with uh, speak to which was this question about versions of articles and which one to cite when you've got a preprint you've got a final published version you may have a repository version you know what what's the best practice I mean, I think, yeah, I think uh, Catherine may have answered this as well. The, um, if, you're, if you're wanting to cite in the usual way the results of a study, then the version of record, which is mm. the journal publishes, is, is the one to go for. Um, obviously, if you want to say the preprint said one thing and the paper said another, you're going to cite both of them, or if you want to cite something that's only in a specific version. But otherwise, that's why we talk about this version of record. But I will say that there's an added complexity that sometimes journals update articles. So, for example, we have living systematic reviews, which are the idea that you're doing the same systematic review, but you're finding new results. We published one on therapies for COVID and, you know, that changed mm. over time. And you need to be clear about which version of that you're citing. So I do think it gets complicated, but most of the time what you want is the the single final version that is published in a journal. Absolutely. And Stephen, I don't know, did you want to add anything there? Um, no, I don't think so. I agree. Uh, ultimately, the, the, and uh, I would say that sometimes um, people get concerned about preprint sharing or uh, whether they should be depositing their accepted manuscript, etc. But and 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 also some some very old fashioned views of uh, publishers have been that the uh, accepted manuscript undermines the, the the version of record and quite the opposite it, it drives people to use the version of record because if you identify something citable you should always go and double check the version of record um it, it should only be if the version of record is truly unavailable to you that you should then be citing any other version and i think you have to be very clear in your citation what rec what what version you are citing Great, thank you for that. Well, while on the subject of versions then, uh, here's here's another one. Should we in the preprints world, or when there's a preprint published and then a paper published, there was a question, Theo, about should the preprint be updated to match 
the version of record, which I thought was a very interesting question. And, 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 and if I may, a linked item as well about these branching uh, uh, sort of possibilities when, when you throw the world of preprints into the mix is, you know, what happens, uh, is there any concern around bad practices where, you know, an author could publish a preprint and then not in a non-linked way, publish a research article and then have two items under their CV, but they're actually the same work. Yeah, so I mean, so to the first one, um, well, now I've forgotten the first one, so I'll answer the second one. I mean, it's always been possible for people to, you know, do a meeting presentation and a, and a review article and a, and a research article, and they're all frankly the same thing. Mm. Um, I would, I think all respectable preprint servers and journals advocate linking those things as tightly together as you can. Crossref, which is provides these sort of behind the scenes linkages for our for our business, you know, has attributes like preprint of and final version of, so that it is easy to tell, uh, you know, what's a preprint, what's a final version, and um, uh, which one should I be citing? I've remembered the other question was. What about keep updating the preprint until it matches the published article? Yes. So in the sort of um, the best practice put out currently by uh, preprint servers and journals is that you should stop updating a preprint at the time you have something that's accepted for publication. So you might have an author's manuscript, but you won't have a very final version that's been copy edited, proofread, and all those things that a journal has done for it. Uh, you will only get that in the journal. Some would go further and say it should only be the version you submitted as a revised manuscript. But I would certainly encourage people certainly update preprints. That's that's part of what they're for. Great, thank you. Thanks for and that I think clarity. I just gonna yes, add go on, that, Catherine. That I think yes. that. Um, a lot of preprint servers now will actually provide good linking to the final article. So it makes it very easy. Again, thinking about that, am I trying to bolster my CV? Um, that is you know, less easy in cases where uh, the preprint server is linking through to the final article. And again, I would encourage, sometimes that's difficult if your author list or your title has changed. So again, when you have finally published your article, you can always contact or often contact the preprint server, certainly by archive, and I assume Med Archive as well, Theo, uh, to let them know the paper's been published and then the link will appear so that it's clear that these are different versions of essentially the same piece of work. Yeah. Now, um, thank you, thank you for that clarification as well, Catherine. And um, the 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 one thing I wanted to um, just uh, sort of touch upon is is the whether anything more needed to be said about this interface then between preprint and journal and journal really. You know that can you tell us a little bit more about how the metadata and the linking just sort of does this work for you because. Really, the researcher, if if the journal has the right interlinking with the preprint server in place, the researcher shouldn't really need to do very much. Isn't that right? That's absolutely correct. So first of all, to talk about at the point of submission, many publishers, I'm not sure about company biologists, but certainly the MJ journals allow you to, to say at the time of submission, either this already exists as a preprint or indeed from one from a preprint server to the journal please submit this from the journal, please submit this to the preprint server. So those links can exist from the time of submission. But then on uh, publication, there's a, a trawl that's done by BioArchive and MedArchive with sort of fuzzy matching to try and check if we don't, if we don't already know what paper this is linked to, is there anything that now looks like this paper? Now in the unusual circumstance, all the authors and the title and you know the corresponding author's institution etc if they've all changed then there can be failures of linking and there have been some people have, have done studies trying to work out how often that happens and initially it was maybe up to 50 percent of the time it was failing and now hopefully it's going down and down to a smaller percentage but as Catherine says if it doesn't happen automatically there are ways to to manually do it as long as someone tells 
the preprint server, uh, that that's what they need to do. And then publishers also say on submission, was this ever a preprint? Please tell us, where is it? And they will then try and make sure that is cited in the final article in whatever way they recommend, unfortunately, not all the same way, but um, to make that link evident. Great, thank you for that, Theo. Um, so I, I, I'm going to come to uh, a, a couple of final questions for, um, for, for the panel. And I'd like each of you to give me a, a view on this, if you don't mind. One is, um, I, I said at the start that something that ties us together is perhaps that, one of the things that ties us together is service to the scholars themselves and, and the scholarly community. And I think one thing that we all take quite seriously is this business of reducing friction so that researchers can focus on the subject of their research, right? Um, and can each of you give me a, a, a thought about how you, in your role, doing what you're doing, is helping reduce that friction for scholars. So we can just reassure what items are out there and systems and processes are out there to help them through their process of scholarly comms. Shall I jump in with the, a bit about open access? So I think, you know, when we launched our read and publish agreements, um, authors generally came to us and we would say, oh, you can have fee free publishing. And they were really surprised. And um, I, I personally did a series of interviews with authors to just say, how was the experience? What happened here? How could we make that easier for you? So actually, I mean, the answer is listening, isn't it? So um, I, I, I actually um, did that personally, and it was really exciting to hear from researchers about their work and what the open access meant to them, and then to be able to look at ways of making that as smooth as possible in terms of our in-house process for making that author aware of how they could you know, publish um, open access without a fee. Great, thank you. Uh, Stephen, did you want to go next? Oh, sorry. I'm just working around my screen. Um, I'm happy to. Yeah, um, I think so. Myself and my team have thousands of interactions across the year with uh, researchers trying to facilitate their APCs, answer their, their difficult emails, answer their easy emails. But I think that the most impactful thing that we do is uh, very similar to what Claire just said, is gather their feedback understand what the barriers are to them engaging with this more effectively and then actually working with funders and publishers in order to ensure that there are systems and workflows and processes and communications in place to ensure that it's all there at the point of need uh, because these individuals want to be experts in the systematics of their group they're working on they want to be able to think about the clinical aspects of the, their work they don't want to be thinking about the intricacies of licensing and publishing and paying for publishing so exactly. we're just trying to make it as smooth as possible uh, by working with all our stakeholders great well Catherine you're next in the in the circle <laughs> yeah I guess I'd come at this from a, a sort of very different angle which is more from the editorial side which is I think that one thing that we as as publishers are increasing or many publishers are increasingly trying to do and but can still do better at is 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 easing those discussions between authors and editors where we're you know whether that's before submission whether that's once you've got a set of referee reports back and you're trying to decide how to revise your paper I think making the uh, making it clear that the editor is a person um, mm. and that it's somebody that you can actually discuss things with in trying to uh, sort of focus your your revisions of your paper. Um, I think that's something that, that we and a lot of publishers are, are trying to do better at, we can still do better at, and that is, you know, in terms of really trying to make the path from submissions through to publication uh, easier, you know, easier than it currently is, is really trying to uh, encourage discussions between the authors and the editors where that's helpful. That's that's great and nice to have that different perspective as well from the editorial side, and and Theo. Yeah, I mean, I I have uh, as befits my role probably. I have one answer as a publisher and one as an editor. So as a publisher, let me say that BMJ publishes maybe seventy journals, and part of what we're trying to do is make it that authors get to the right journal immediately and don't have to uh, get rejected from one before they go to another uh, so that they 
you know, they can ask where does my paper belong and be told the answer and then get a smooth journey through to publication because that process is so wasteful of authors yeah. submitting and revising and resubmitting. Um, but then also as an editor, one of the things that BMJ does with authors is encourage their medical authors to work with patients and actually have patients as co-authors. We have patients as reviewers, we have patient contributors, because actually if what you want is medicine that works for people, it's best if you, as Claire was saying about listening to our authors, it's best if you also include the patients in the, in the research and the write-up of it. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you. And 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 having those open access publication values does just that. It opens it up to everybody. Um, so it, the the um, we we are at just over <laughs> half past the hour. So I should wrap it up here. Thank you everybody for your time, and thank you also to the company of biologists and hubs. Um, and thank you for making this open so that anybody could. Uh, uh, attend and also be able to listen in. And my final message to you as a registrant, as a participant, is um, to think about, from all the things we've heard about, think about what's important to you when you are choosing your publication venue. Is that the junction of preprint and paper? Is that open access? Is that post-publication events and press releases and, and, and promotion? Is that what does the publisher do with the money? that comes in from the publishing process. You know, so many things can matter to you. You have power, you have influence as the scholar wanting to put your work out there. Think about where you are putting that work and, and remember that we love engaging with you. Thanks everyone for your time. Cheers. Thank you Malavika for chairing us. Um, and That's just to goodness. confirm that there will be a recording of the session available to delegates later. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye.